Is everyone in? Hello, everyone. Uh, this is the April webinar presented by the Essex County Branch of Ontario Ancestors. My name is Linda Urquhart, and I will be your host for tonight. Cindy Robichaud will be monitoring the questions. Thanks to Cindy for doing that. Before we start, we would like to acknowledge the Indigenous peoples of all the lands that we are on today, including the first inhabitants of Essex County. The Anishinaabe group, part of the Three Fires Confederacy, comprising the bands Potawatomi, Ottawa, and Ojibwa or Chippewa, as well as the Huron or Wendat or Wyandotte bands. As family historians, we look for the stories of the men and women who came before us. In doing that, we must acknowledge the mistakes of the past and consider how we can move forward in the spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. Thanks for joining us. Just a reminder that this presentation is being recorded and will be added to the Essex County Branch YouTube channel. Also, everyone is muted and your camera is turned off during the presentation. Questions will be answered following the presentation. Just add your questions as we go along to the chat box, which you will find when you hover your mouse at the bottom of your screen. We will add a handout to the chat box during the presentation. For those who are first time visitors to our webinars, we are one of the 35 branches or special interest groups of Ontario ancestors, also known as the Ontario Genealogical Society, which is the largest member supported genealogical organization in Canada. It was founded in 1961 with its mission to encourage, bring together, and assist those interested in the pursuit of family history and to preserve Ontario's genealogical heritage. We encourage you to visit the website where you can do a search for what they have on file about your ancestor. You can view their monthly education webinars and you can find family history products available in the marketplace. It is worth your while to investigate what is available to assist you in your research. These are the various links that the Essex County branch offers to assist you. Feel free to take a screenshot. Our website includes information about the branch as well as many free public resources and free indexes to the publications in the Essex County Library collection. You can also view any upcoming events on our website. You will find the link to our members library, which has a wealth of digitized resources from our library collection. In addition, we also have a link to the Essex Marketplace where you can purchase any of our publications. We hope you will join the Essex County Branch Facebook group, which well ha has well over a thousand members now. And the group is very active in answering your questions and they're always happy to assist you. Other links include our YouTube channel where you can view the past presentations. And we always encourage you to interact with us by following us on Twitter and Instagram. The next webinar of the Essex County Branch is on Wednesday, May the 19th at 7 p.m. It is presented by the cemetery team of the branch. It is entitled Saving History, One Stone at a Time at Historic Windsor Grove Cemetery. They will be discussing their activities these past few years at Windsor Grove Cemetery in Windsor, Ontario. They will explain how they uncovered and cleaned the stones, Many interesting stories were revealed in their work when researching the names on the headstones, and they will display pictures of the most unusual headstones they found in this very, very old cemetery. Tonight's webinar is presented by Cookie Foster. As an adopted child, Cookie was always curious about her background. She applied for her non-identifying information, the original case files, and she met her birth family. This set her on a course and inspired her passion for genealogy. A hometown gentleman's background led her to join British Home Children Canada research on Facebook. And this made her wonder how many British home children were in Essex County. So she began a database recording their names and trying to find their history. Quite accidentally, while researching the children and her own family tree, an ancestry document for her uncle David, 
led her to discover that her very own grandmother was a British home child. So I will pass this on to Cookie to begin her presentation. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the meeting tonight. Um, in my talk tonight, there are some um, bullet points as well as a few photos and a set of handout sheets with British Home Child links and books that you can um, read for your um, for your pleasure. Um, Linda's just put up this. So I'm going to talk about first the conditions in the British Isles post-industrial revolution and what led these children to being uh, migrated at the time. So in post-industrial revolution UK, about 75% of the population was making its living off the land. Droughts, crop failures, landlords taking land back, and the long depression, as it was called, saw thousands leave their rural homes of generations for large urban centers for work. On arriving in the cities, they found extended family support was gone, high unemployment, two to five families living in one room in these shoddy homes. Many actually lived in the cellars of the buildings for lack of space often with two toilets and a pump for one whole street. At the beginning of the 19th century, less than one million people lived in London. By the 1850s, the capital's population had doubled and by the end of the 19th century, 6.5 million people lived in the ever expanding part of Greater London. <clears throat> Excuse me, in 1871, there were 390 people per square mile, and by 1901, it was 560. Now, that's a lot of people. So overcrowded was London at the time that the filth and stench from manure, rotting food, and human waste was ever present, and disease and epidemics were never far behind. Parents could rarely find, rarely find work but it was never enough to feed a hungry family, keep them clothed and keep a roof over their heads. Institutions all over England, Scotland, um, Ireland and Wales were bursting at the seams. So to reduce the surplus of destitute children, an emigration scheme was designed to remove the children to Canada and other Commonwealth countries. And so um, I'm gonna talk next about the years of immigration and the philanthropists involved. So starting in 1869, until the 1930s, British philanthropists immigrated about 100,000 children ages 2 to 17 to Canada. There are approximately 50 organizations that we know of that are involved. There, these are a few of the major ones. Maria Rye, 4,200 children. Church of England, Waves and Strays, 4,600. Middlemore, 5,000. National Children's Home, 3,600. Annie McPherson, 8,000. Catholic Emigration, 10. Uh, Fagans, 3,100, Quarriers from Scotland, uh, 7,000, and Dr. Bernardo Tatsamala, 30,000. About 2% of the children were actually orphans. Some were taken off the streets, some from workhouses, or from parents who were living in grinding poverty, had illness, or had died, and no longer had a way to look after their children. At that time, there was no safe social safety net for these families, as exists today. So more often than not, the children were relinquished to the organizations in hopes of a better life. They were scooped up by these philanthropists or child savers, given some education, domestic and trades training to be able to survive in an extremely rural frontier as vast as Canada. Um, gotta go here. Um, the siblings were separated. Um, the newspapers reported each boat. Oh, wait a minute, I messed up there, I'm sorry. <laughs> so the children were told that Canada was the land of milk and honey. There was Indians, cowboys, money grew on trees, and all kinds of good things waited for them. As they soon discovered, um, these descriptions couldn't be further from the truth. They were just considered a cheap source of, of labor. In 1891, the Honorable Frederick Nichols MP on the Standing Committee on Immigration and Labor wrote an article called Undesirable Immigrants, where he stated, and I quote, these waifs and strays are tainted and corrupt with moral slime and filth inherited from parents and surroundings of the most foul and disgusting character, and all the washing and clean clothes that Dr. Bernardo may bestow cannot possibly remove. There is no power whatever that can cleanse the lepers so as to fit them to become desirable citizens of Canada. 
Further, it was stated that Dr. Bernardo was doing a great wrong in dumping his human warts and excrescences in Canada. Dr. Bernardo also coined the phrase philanthropic abduction to describe how he took children in from homes he regarded as unsavory. I'm um, going to talk about the uh, Great War. Um, approximately 10,000 uh, children actually signed up and served. And in the virtual cemetery that we have for these children, um, there's approximately 1,200 to date that we've recorded that never returned. They bravely fought at Vimy Ridge, Hill 70, and Passchendaele. 360 are memorialized on the Menin Gate and Vimy Memorials. And it is possible that most of these boys enlisted in World War I, they saw a way out of bad placements and a way to find their lost loved ones. And some may actually went to fight for king and country. We have um, two British home children who won the Victoria Cross, Claude Nunney and Walter Lee Lockett Rayfield. Emigration ceased during the war, but had started again in the 20s. And in the World War II, about 20,000 enlisted and some were also veterans of World War I. Tonight, I think Penny May, May is here. She is one of our moderators, and she also is in charge of the virtual cemetery that we have for the children. All right. So the Canada Clause is, was put into an agreement between the institution taking the child into care and the parent guardian of the child. It enabled the institution to send the child to Canada with having not to notify the parent or guardian beforehand. Many of the parents or guardians didn't understand what it meant as they returned to take their home, their child home when they, things got better and they were told their child was had left for Canada. Further contact between the child and the parent, guardian or siblings was highly unlikely to occur. Um, can you switch the slide there, Linda, please? All right, so um, I'm going to talk about the British home children in Canada and how they live their lives. Um, so I lost my sheet here. Uh, all right, so once the children were ready to ship to Canada, their trunks or bags were packed with a variety of clothing thought suitable for the seasons here, toiletries, sewing kits, along with a Bible and possibly a Pilgrim's Progress book. In England, they were taken to the Liverpool dock with their names pinned on their clothes <clears throat> where they might have um, sang at the dock, Eternal Father Strong to Save, before they boarded those ships. Once on the ship in the steerage, they set sail, most probably homesick or pretty seasick. Um, after spending a week or two at, at sea, they landed at various ports in Canada, um, some in the U.S., and then sending to receiving homes throughout Canada. Siblings were separated at this time and most never saw each other again. The newspapers usually reported each boat of children and the people would flock to get a child. It was cheap labor. Such was the demand that there was at least seven applications for each child. Each application came with a $3 non-refundable fee. These were backed up with recommendations from clergy or some other important citizen. Once assigned to a new family, the contracts were signed and the indenture began with their new master and mistresses. They were supposed to provide board, feed, clothing, and school to the children, but even that was never adhered to. Most children had no schooling whatsoever. Children had no shoes, slept in barns, had inadequate clothing, and didn't get their owed pay upon aging out. These young children were so ill-equipped to deal with the demands placed on them. The inspection of children also was few and far between, probably due to the great distance of their placements, or for other reasons, and schooling was rare. They were ridiculed for being one of those homeboys or homegirls and called gutter children, street Arabs, gutter snipes, and many more nasty names. The isolation, loneliness, and homesickness must have been just overwhelming. 
Many children did have good homes, but there are those who suffered horrible physical and psychological abuse, neglect, starved not only for food, but emotionally, lack of stability, and also sexual assault at the hands of their masters and other people. <clears throat> some children were charged with crimes, some were driven to suicide, and actually some were actually murdered. The children through their lives in Canada were ashamed of the stigma attached to being a home child and bottled it up inside, rarely speaking of their experiences. Most never ever saw their families again. There are so many stories left to be told of these children who helped build our nation. It is said that 10% of Canada's population is actually descended from a British home child. So how I got involved with the British home child and the researching um, and documenting children, I had posted on my hometown Facebook that I have about a wonderful, awesome man from our community, Alfred Rowlandson. He was much respected and much loved. I was told by a boy there, oh, he was one of those homeboys from England. So my curiosity was piqued and I decided to find out what that was. It led me on a Google search of many articles and documents and along with my passion for genealogy to my joining the Home Canada research on Facebook. I was also thinking, I wonder how many children were placed there came to Essex County. So I started to list and started to work and uh, document them and research them. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit too uh, about uh, uh, the last two known surviving home children that we have. We have Sir George Beardshaw of London, Ontario, who is much loved and he's in his 90s. Um, we thought he was the only one. And then about a month ago, we found Albert Middleton from Victoria, BC. He turned 108 years old in the middle of March this year. And those are the last two that we actually know of. Um, we also have British Home Child Day each year, September 28th, and officially was recognized in 2010. Canada Post issued a commemorative stamp and each year on the 28th, cities, towns, businesses, bridges, and other locations light up in red, white, and blue in remembrance and honor of the British home children of Canada, including our own city of Windsor City Hall, downtown. Um, so I'm going to talk now a little bit about my grandmother. Um, her name was Catherine or Kathleen Agnes Brewster. Um, I've been chasing my grand for nearly 40 years. Everything I found for her led me in the wrong direction. Nothing ever made sense. And I struggled greatly over these past few years. It wasn't until I found my Uncle David's New York Social Security record on Ancestry that things started to look up. I thought, wow, this is great. A few questions to my mother confirmed her name as well as the Kathleen part. Two DNA tests later, a new second Brewster cousin in England, and an obit just added to the Owen Sound newspaper made all the dots connect. I was so excited I almost fell off my office chair. I was researching in the Home Child Registry a day. You know, I can't explain it, but I had just this urge to search her name, so I did. And imagine my shock, there she was in black and white my grandmother. Um, Catherine was born in Mary, Marylebone, England, London, England on April 1902. She spent the majority of her first 10 years, and I mean the majority, in a workhouse along with her parents and siblings. The children, um, oh, here she is. Uh, she was sent to Canada in August of 1912, shortly after her father died age 10 to Stratford, then out for a domestic. I do not know where she was placed and may never know. I'm in queue for her records from Annie McPherson, records that are held by Barnardo's in England. Sadly, my grandmother had a tragic accident at home and passed away in 1938, leaving eight living children the ages of two to 12. The boys were sent out to farms to work and the girls were boarded out. My mother was only three and she remembers very little. My granddad decided to join the Navy shortly after, and he did remarry in 1940, but the family never recovered or reunited from this tragedy or separation. 
there are no surviving children of her, no surviving photos of her or the children. And it is doubtful my grand ever saw her family again. You know, I can almost see that little girl standing on the Liverpool dock with 36 other children, possibly crying, most likely upset. And it must have been quite a sight that that ship was to a 10 year old little girl and to board it for a two week sailing away from her friends and family to Quebec. And then the long journey to Stratford and then out to her placements. This has been a very frustrating, but such an emotional journey for me. And it still continues today in the search for her ship siblings and her families that we have managed to trace in England at this point. Um, the British Home Children has a mission um, that I'm involved with, with every day. Um, we, like, we are finding a, one child at a time and documenting these children, reuniting the long lost families at home and overseas to educate and to promote their stories. We are the voice for the children who have been silent for so long and the silence has to stop. So we are able to tell their stories through our research. It's um, emotional, but it's wonderful when you find a child and can reunite them with their families. So um, on the next couple of pages, um, I have a few photos and then I have a handout as well. So this is a photo of, um, I can't see it here. This, I can't see the writing, Linda. <laughs> um, this is a photo of a, a, a ship that came over with some children on it. And this is what most of them looked like when they came. Some are smiling, some are, you know. Um, so, and this was normal. Uh, the, the ships ranged anywhere from like my grandmother at 37 to oh, well over 200 for each, each ship that came over. Um, usually it was the Allen line, I think, that uh, brought the children over. So, Linda, can I go to the next? Yep. Please. The next picture. Okay, this is at Fagan's home. There's, uh, Fagan's was one of the men that brought over boys to Toronto, and that's who this um, Alfred Rollinson came with. They wrote their names in the wall of the, at the back of the Fagan's building in Toronto. Unfortunately, this building is pretty much in disrepair, where I'm hoping that someday they can save it. Those bricks are, are really something that these children, and we have researched the children that are on here, um, I think I have another photo of that too on the next screen. Now this is this is this one really upsets me. Whoops, uh, sorry. Oh, that's okay. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. Go back one more. Okay. <laughs> All right. So this was by George Cruikshank. And um, as the caption I have there, the lady on the right hand side is actually Maria Rye. She was quite the lady. Um, this picture really bothers me. It, it just, it's awful, really. They're just scooping up all these extra children, sweeping them up off the floor and shoving them in the cart. So it's its just awful. It's just, it's an awful picture, but it tells you what they thought of those children in those days. And there was quite a, a lot of children and they were overrun with children before they sent them here and they just didn't know what to do with them. So this, he made this, I think it appeared in the paper. It's actually held by the London Museum. So um Okay, can I go to the next one? Okay, this is a stamp that was issued on September 2010 by Canada Post to celebrate the British home children. Um, that's about all we have besides what we do. So um, that's about all there is. Now this is Lori on the, on the gold jacket. She's, she's our CEO. Um, this is a mass grave. Sorry. Of, that's okay. This is a mass grave of a bunch of children that were in, they're all unmarked and it was like a mass grave. And she was going around, a, I think she said an antique store or something. And the guy said something. So she started looking and she has managed to find their records. Um, their, I think their burial records. And this is the memorial that was made. Um, it's a ship's window on the top and it lists all of the children that are buried in that cemetery. Um, I think there's another one there too, but this one's really special. It's just, it was just done. So it's pretty neat actually, because the ship's window represents the ships that they came on. This is the um, 
Ivy Sochi and John Sayers actually started this. They they promoted it. And there are, uh, I think, five, no, there says 9,000 names. And each each child is named. And it's not, the, this is not the only, um, the only panel. I think I put a link down there below. You can actually look at the, all the different panels that have all the children on there. I guess they're in alphabetical order as well. So 9,000 children came over at the Hazel Bray there. So that's pretty interesting too. Where is Hazel Bray? Peterborough. Oh. Yeah. And this is my dear Alfred. Alfred was raised in Auburn with a bunch of us. He was our postmaster for over 30 years. He was a harness maker as well. He is enlisting for World War I. Um, Alfred came on the Empress of Britain, the maiden voyage. And it was really funny because when I researched him, the ship that he sailed to World War I was the same ship that he came to Canada on. This is his lovely wife, Mary. Um, I do have a picture of her in her wedding dress, which the dress was actually sewed by my grandmother. Um, my adopted grandmother and um, it's quite it's quite the thing like he just was the most wonderful man you couldn't ask for anything nicer he did write a letter back to Fagans which I think I put in the handout she had gave quite a a write-up about him um, but they were wonderful people really really wonderful people um, we do have another one um, in Auburn you know, uh, John Molden is another one. And we have a little girl that died with the Ball family. And they're, she, they're all buried in the Ball Cemetery. Now, this is the ship that my grandmother came on. Um, she left Liverpool on August the 30th, 1912, and arrived in Quebec on the, September the 6th, 1912, at the age of 10. And her occupation would have most likely been a domestic. And I can't even imagine what that little girl thought when she saw that big boat. I imagine her eyes are probably as big as saucers. You know, it's it's um, it's um a small amount of children. Like I said, it's a very small amount of children. It, there was usually a heck of a lot more than that. There's, like I said, there was usually, mm, you know, whatever, 300 or so. Um, this is, that was the McPherson home. It's where my grandmother was sent um, after I guess she got off the train. Um, this home still stands at 51 Avon Street. It's a little bit different now, but it is still there and it is a registered building. So it's registered with Heritage Canada as a building, um, but it does still exist and you can actually drive by it and see it. It's just a lot different now. And I can just imagine, was that my grandmother standing on that porch or whose, whose daughter was that? So those are young children at the top there. Um, so. It's pretty neat, actually, to have these places. There are other places that still exist as well, other uh, receiving homes as well, that still exist to this day. And indeed, some of the charities that were sent, um, that sent, um, that were sent over, that they still exist today, like Bernardo's and different ones still exist today. Um, I've also included a handout sheet um the bunch of links on it i think linda can go back to that i don't have the handout sheet here you don't have the handout sheet okay so no, what uh, I, it should be in the chat it's probably uh cindy probably put it in the chat oh, did so she? uh people have been able to download it while okay. you've been talking right so that so those are just links to um different places that you can search for british home children uh, a lot of them are ours um from the research group <clears throat> um the other ones are books that are written by different people on um, british home children and or the movement or the poverty or whatever um and then underneath that i think on the second page i've listed a bunch of fictional writers that have written about British home children the last, I don't know, 10 years or so. And I hope I haven't forgotten anybody. And then underneath that one, um, there was um, a bunch of uh, like four or five children's books. And it's, there's not as many children's books as there is adult books for reading. And then I think underneath that one um, is the, uh, the article about Alfred. And it gives a story of his life and his children and his wife and who he lived with in Auburn 
and um, the letter that he actually wrote to Fagan's, that was actually in the Fagan's index, which I got off of um, Global Genealogy has it on CD. So you can get the Fagan's newsletter. So I ordered it and his, his letter was in there. When I searched his name, it was actually in there. So he had, yeah, they had to pay back. Fagan's had to pay back. I think it was 10 pounds. I think they had to pay for their sailing and they had to pay that back. So but anyway, I think that's just about all I got here. I just um, wanted to show you this last slide that uh, this is the Essex County Branch website. And you can see under resources, yeah. we do have a connection to the British Home Children Index that we've prepared. Uh, it has, I think, 358 names of people yeah. that um, probably uh, they either were situated here you know as a British home child or perhaps they moved here after they left uh, the farm where they were working and uh, if I could actually go to I'm going to try something here so just bear with me I'm going to stop sharing this for a minute and I'm going to try to share something else Okay, wait a minute now. Sorry, I've never done this, so I'm a little bit. That's okay. Maybe while you're getting that up and going, uh, Linda, okay. um, Cookie, there was a couple questions. Um, yes. And actually, one of them was more, more of a comment. So the $3 non-refundable fee that you're speaking of, Yes. Um, it sounds like that was a little bit of a, a money maker. Was that? Oh, it, yes, it was a very big money maker. They, Bernardo, for existence, with all the different things that he had going on, he made in the millions, like 20, 60 million, 20 million. I read in an article, I think it was on our website. Um, he made a lot of money. So really, was it philanthropy or was it something else? It's a lot of money. And back that that's in today's money. Mm -hmm. So you're looking at probably, I think the two figures I read was 16 million to 20 something million in today's money that he would have made off those children. Right. So, so really was, I don't consider that being philanthropic at all. I consider that, you know, making money off the children. So um, he was the one though, did he um, fund everything like the travel and the expenses and the whole closing? Yes. So was he, he, yeah, he did. He did. Um, the only one that I actually know of offhand is the Fagans one where they had to pay the money back. I don't know if Penny Maj can kind of correct me on that. Mike Ma, Ma can cannot correct me on that, but I think he was the only one that ever, uh, Fagan was the only one that charged them to pay back. And there could be more, but as far as I, I remember, there's only Fagans. But yeah, he did fund it and he had, oh, he had homes all over the UK. I mean, he had a ton of homes to put these children in. And when you figure he sent 30,000 people, 30,000 children over here, that's a lot of children. Mm -hmm. you know. So you would hope that $3, he, you would hope that he used it in, uh, you know, preparing the children to travel and housing them and clothing them. So one would hope, right? Uh -huh. <laughs> Um, another comment was just a, a, a re, uh, reiterating. So the one fellow that you said that you uh, found um, out west, um, did you say he was 108 years old? Yes, in the, about the 11th of, I think it was around the 11th of March or so, he turned 108 years old. Okay. He came with the National Children's Home. That was another one of the ones I mentioned. Yeah, he came with them as a boy. And um, I think he was in Ontario and that there's an article in, in one of the newspapers uh, from, uh, if you just look up his name, it actually comes up, but he did turn 108 years old. That's, yeah. uh, that's a lot of good years. Wow, I guess so. Uh, and then the last uh, question that I see right now, I can, uh, I can, oh, uh, actually, Doreen, what year did this start in England? 1869 with Maria Rye. She was the first one. She brought a bunch of children over. She was very controversial. Um, she didn't keep financial records or anything on the children. She didn't really, she just basically, I guess, just brought them to Ken and dumped them off. And that was the extent of it. She's uh, quite the lady. And then um, there's a link on the handout sheet to the Doyle report. He was sent over from England um, 
to make a report on the the migration itself. And Maria Rye and Annie McPherson came under fire for that, um, for not following up and really not doing a good job. Um, it's just, it's a sad, sad situation. And I'm really, it's really sad that nobody knows when you ask somebody, oh yeah, I got to do some work on the British home tour. And they look at you like you, you flipping lost your mind. Like what? They have no idea. They don't know. So that is our mission is to make sure that these children are remembered. Exactly. Um, Doreen also asked, were Scotland and Ireland also included in these schemes? Yes, yeah, Scotland, Ireland, and Wales and England as well. Okay. All four. I just said the UK because, I mean, I didn't really know how to classify that anymore. But yes, yeah. the couriers came from Scotland. I think there was Smiley's in Dublin. Bernardo's was there also. There was Wales as well and, and England, of course. Okay. Um, and then Terry has more of a comment. She, um, uh, sorry, Terry, I'm not sure he, she <laughs> um, has, has posted, um, I have found a few people in the asylum records. Have you had that experience? In asylums? Yeah. Um, I don't think the children so much. Um, I know my grandfather was in, my grandfather was in, an, my great grandfather was in an asylum and that's where he died. Um, I guess you could. Now, I found my, my youngest aunt, Winifred, in a home for Christian blind, Christian aged blind men, women and men. But there's a whole bunch of children in there. So they might have been there as a, um, you know, making extra money by kick, taking the kids in like an orphanage kind of thing. Sure, sure. It was in Islington. So I'm assuming it might have been part of the workhouse. I'm not really sure. I've not been able to find anything more. But the asylum's not so much. I don't think... Most of them were, were put in the homes that belonged to the philanthropists, um, workhouses. Like I said, some were picked up off the street, but I don't think I've ever seen any out of an asylum that I know of. Okay, hopefully that answers uh, Terry's question. But you uh, never know. Sure, Doreen says, thank you, Cookie. Um, oh, and then the last one that I had was, uh, you mentioned DNA. Um, and is that helping you to connect with family in England? Oh, big time. Yeah. Well, England and Scotland too. Um, my, my paternal side, it's all Scottish. Um, when I did the ancestry, it gave me some, but my mother's, my maternal side was not getting tested. But I did find her, her brother's kids. We were all put up for adoption. There's a lot of illegitimacy in my family for some reason. And um, I wasn't satisfied with that. So I went and did 23andMe Canada. And again, the same thing happened. I have maybe, I think I have three or four second and first cousins. And the rest are all McDonald's on my dad's side. That's what they are. <laughs> I don't have hardly any on my mother's side. They're just not being tested. I did find my cousin, Mike. He is from Kent. Um, and he has done a great deal of research on my family who actually came, lived in Rutland for generations and generations. And then they came to London. I'm assuming they came to London because there was no work. It's pretty rural there. Mm -hmm. um, so. Okay. Um, and then Terry, yeah, Terry just clarified. Um, speaking of more, they ended up in asylums and she says, I'm female. Thanks a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess she's thinking some of the British home children that she has found uh, they ended up in asylums as adults. Oh, they could have. Oh, yeah, they could have. As adults, they could have. Yes, but not as children. You don't see it. But yeah, they could have ended up, you know, as uh, in a home for whatever reason. I don't think I've ever seen it. Penny may have seen something, but I haven't really seen anything like that. But it is possible. Right. Okay, I don't see any of the questions or comments. Uh, Linda, I don't know if you want to. Yeah, if you just, go. if we just got a few minutes, yeah. Um, you can see my screen, right? Yeah. Okay, so this is the British Home Children under, under Resources. This is the uh, index, and you can do a search right here where you can put in a surname or whatever to see if. But all you're going to find on on our our resources page is the fact that we have this person as a person that we've identified as a British home child. Uh, if you go into the members library as a member, you could do this um, and go to the same index. I'm going to go to the British home children has its own tab. 
it's the same index, but the difference is that now you can open it to see what we've found. I'll just open this one, Atherton, William. I have more information on him, I think. Uh, oh, that's not the right one. I have, no, I have, I I think would... I have, I have more information on William Atherton, actually. Okay, so for example, like Frederick, we know what ship he came on. We know the date of arrival. Uh, we were able to find his parents, the names of his parents. So that's included on, on the database. We've also ha have names of his sister, at least a brother, and the fact that he has three sisters, uh, the name of his wife and when he got married, and the names of his children that he had when he came to Canada. As well, the, there is information that he was on the 1921 census in Wheatley. Uh, and that he died uh, May 18th, 1977 in Windsor. And then the LAC sources, these are just the what they put on the Library and Archives Canada website as far as where they got the information, uh, you know, what was given at the time of the application. Sometimes there's hardly anything there, but sometimes there's more. So, usually, so that's you can usually find more information about them on the GRO or the Scotland's people. You can find their family members or ancestry too. Yeah, it depends on their name. You know, some oh, names are just so common. common. Yeah, it's you have hard to, to find. Yeah. yeah, it is hard. Um, I will try to get you the information that I do have here. I have a binder full. I do here in county as well. So um, I was going to ask you, do you have your database online anywhere? No, or? I don't. It's in a book. Yeah, I, I was working so much I never had time but I do have a, a binder here with Essex County I was going to match mine against yours and see what you had and what I have um there are that I know of right now I don't know if you remember me posting on the OGS somebody posted you know when you go and do the graves and stuff there was that Carrie um P, not Pilon Carrie starts with a P anyway she, her name was Carrie Gusterson and she had a sister that also married a Frank Leffler. Um, so I do have quite a bit of information on her. And she's actually buried at the Grove. And then I found another one, too. There's quite a few buried at the Grove. Um, yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure. There is. There's quite a few. I just actually got one I got to go take a picture of um, shortly. I have his name, Flynn, Flynn something or other. Um, it would be nice to be able to document the ones that are in there. Well, one of the ways that we... Um... Uh, developed this database, not just from the Library and Archives Canada, but we sent out on our Facebook groups uh, a request saying that, you know, if one of your ancestors was came here as a British home child, please let us know so that we can add them to the database. So we did get a lot of people and they have people that have done their own research for their own ancestor, they have a lot more information. Like, so some people were able to give me copies of what they got from the Bernardo files, like the actual picture of the child when they were first put into the, into the home in Canada and that kind of stuff. But Bernardo, most of them, I'm sorry, Linda. I'm just saying most of them said that the person that, that was the British home child, never, ever talked about it. No. Never, never really talked about no. it. So I'm sure there might have been some positive cases out there, but uh, I don't, maybe it was more or less the embarrassment of the way they were talked about, even here in Canada. Yeah, it was. That, it, that they may be part horrible. of it. Some of them lived just horrible lives and they just, didn't want to talk about it anymore and sometimes too that went on like intergenerational like it, it went from one generation to the other sure sure the things that they experienced because they never hugged or kissed or told anybody they loved them maybe not like they did at home and and all the things that happened to them I mean I can I can't even imagine like I think of my grandmother I think what did you put up with but you know I'm really proud of her because she had the courage to get off that boat and she lived her life for what it, for as long as it was. She had a good life with my grandfather. She really did. And I'm, yes. I'm very proud of, of the fact that, and the, and the other children as well, like they had a lot of courage to come here. And even though they lived terrible lives or good lives, it doesn't matter. It's, you know, but I wish in the long run that people knew more about the British home children. And that's, you know, we need to promote it. There can't be silence anymore. These children need to have a voice. 
Exactly, exactly. So uh, are there any more questions? Somebody, that we have? Uh, was it Terry, I think, or somebody had a, or no, Penny uh, Turner? Was it Penny yeah, Turner? Peggy, so Peggy Turner, she Peggy said. Turner. She had a question about Huron County. Now Huron County does have their own database as well, I guess, but it, this is my own personal database. So I've just been looking up in case I find something that, you know, you guys missed or the, something that I've gotten off our, our research group. Um, <clears throat> So, but yes, I do do here in County. I am from just outside of Godrich originally. And I know Lambton County has their own database as yes, well. They do. Chatham does too, don't they? I think. I'm not sure. Yeah. I think yeah. Chatham has one yeah. and Elgin County has one too. And then of course the ones out east like Niagara on the lake, they have the Maria Rye records. They have a lot of children replaced there. A lot of children were placed in Quebec. A lot were didn't placed you, in Elmore. Yeah, didn't you say that you're waiting for some records? Was yes. that from Fagan? Bernardo's. Bernardo's took Bernardo. over a lot of the records. Now, they don't have them all, and I should have written down which ones they had. However, um, they do hold the Annie McPherson ones, and um, that's where I had to apply. Now, Bernardo's records are a little more expensive. They do include a, uh, an intake photo and I think a, a before sailing photo, as well as a lot of information. I don't expect too much out of my grandmother's file, probably not any more than what I knew uh, already. Um, it wasn't that expensive. It was 29 pounds for the admin, admin fee and then um, 29 pounds for the file itself. And then I registered, so it was about 125 Canadian, it's all totaled. And I have to wait in queue. They're very far behind. The uh, pandemic has put everybody behind and they are no different. But they do yeah. hold different records. Um, if you look on our, our British Home Child link there, it says Weebly on it. You can find out the sending organizations and there's actually um, a list of, of the places that um, that have the records, where the records are located. Yes, I do have to uh, check out your links because I wasn't familiar with many of them. The only one that I really knew of were, was the Library and Archives Canada. So yeah. I, I definitely will check out these links that you've provided for us. If you're looking for, for birth records, uh, the Ireland one, I think it's .ie or something, they have uh, civil records, but only so far. The right. records don't really exist. And... Um, so Scotland's people is great. It's birth marriages, deaths, old and new, uh, censuses, land tax records. Um, the GRO index is the general register office in, uh, in England, and you can type in a birth or a death. If you want the marriages, you go to free BMD and you can get the marriages there, but you have to send away for them. Um, the Scotland's people is not free. It, I had no. to buy credit. You buy credits. And that they're not expensive, believe me. I think it's six credits to view a document. Um, and then on the GRO, it's seven pounds and it's a PDF or you can actually pay for the um, for the actual birth certificate itself. I do have my grandmother's and her children, her uh, siblings as well. And I think when it's your ancestor that you're doing the research for, you're willing to, to put out you know, whatever, whatever is necessary to get the, to get the information that you need. So um, yeah. I'm glad that you gave us those, those links so that we can try them well, out a ourselves. Lot of, a lot of people don't know. They don't, they don't know where to go. They don't even know, mo most times they don't even know they're related to a British home child. And so if there was a hundred thousand children sent to Canada, right, in those from 1869 to the 1930s, um, and 10% of Canada is descended the population is descended from British home children uh, home children do you really know if you're actually related to one unless you do the research but if you get stuck right. like I did <laughs> it does pay off in the end it does pay off in the end like I said it's been very very emotional and it continues to this day like I lost it the day I really really understood where she was and what she came from Exactly. It's a sad story. I do uh, want to express that for the audience that's listening to us now, uh, if you do go to our website and you don't find um, someone there that you thought maybe might be a British home child, just send it on to me. Um, you can send it to Essex Research at 
ogs.on.ca or just essex at ogs.on.ca. Either way, I'll, I'll get it. And I'll and whatever I get, I'll send on to to Cookie so that she can see um, add they them can, to hers as well. They can, yeah, I can do that. But you can also, if you kind of think they are, and you've done your research, please join us at British Home Child Re Home, Home Children Research on Facebook. Ah, see, I didn't we even know that existed. Search so angels. I... We have so many good search angels. Penny Maya is one of them, even though she's a, she's a moderator as well, but she is a fantastic researcher. We have Sarah, um, Shirley. There's so many search angels on there that will help you find out if that child was or wasn't, and we will tell you if they were Great. or weren't. But we have access to different links. I have more links than what I gave you, um, but you kind of have to... Um, you know, pare it down so that people don't get confused. But I hope I've given everybody the amount of places that they can actually go and look to find out if they're a British home child. Um, the registry is a good place. LAC is a good place. Um, our group is an awesome place. Um, you know, there's just so many links. And the books are good, too, you know, to read about the children in Middlemore. And, and there's a book on Bernardo. There's There was a book on Maria Rye, too, but I don't think that's in publication anymore. Um, there's so many books out there. The one book I do have that's really worth reading that Penny gave to me, it's called The Golden Bridge, and it's by Marjorie Coley. And it's quite a little by. It's called Young Immig Immigrants to Canada, 1833 to 1939. It's quite the book. It's a, it, I call it my Bible. It does give and a lot. Is that on your is that on your handout? um yes i think so good good okay i'm not sure if i got the name but i think i actually got her in one of the links um or the, as as an author i just listed a bunch of authors that have different books um, and then we have our um genevieve graham and um carrie taransky naomi findley there's a lot of authors that write current stuff um there's a new one that came out a little while ago it's from middlemore um, but you have to order it from her website. It's called Awful Kind, and it's pretty graphic. Now, I, mm. wanted, to ask, I wanted to ask to say before we go, I, I was watching a video. There are some videos on YouTube. Um, I think it's called The Forgotten Children, maybe. There was a bunch of Middlemore, yes. a bunch of older Middlemore children got together, and they were having lunch, and they were talking about British, they're being a British home child. And this one old lady, oh, my God, I just lost it. She... I was in tears. She said the first Christmas she spent in Canada, she was all excited about Christmas and she went and hung up her sock and she went down the next morning. She was all excited and the kids were pulling candy and oranges and everything out of their socks. And this poor lady got chicken, chicken legs and potato peelings mm -hmm. in her sock. So that's pretty sad. I mean, I just lost it. I really did. And, and I haven't so there been reunions or haven't yes. there been um, like yes. even from Australia, they had a group of surviving British home children. This may have been quite a few years ago coming to England uh, or something like that. That Or am I just imagining that? I don't know if they had it in, in Australia, if they had it in England. I can't remember. But they weren't just sent to Canada. They were no. sent to Australia, New Zealand. South Africa, oh, there were some all over the place. The Australian one's pretty sad, and they sent them there, I think, until the 70s. They were still sending them. So Don actually, asked, Don actually asked the question about were there any home children sent to Newfoundland colony? There were some, yeah, they were sent to uh, Newfoundland, uh, PEI, Nova Scotia. Um, I think that Middlemore did a lot of that. Um, there is a group for Middlemore homes, actually. Well, isn't that the story where Anna Green Gable sort of there's a grain of salt or a truth in that? That it, no, I don't think there was. I don't think anybody's really okay. said it. No, I don't think it, the book was. I guess maybe that was going on while the migration was going on, but there was. I don't. It was based on a girl, but I don't think anybody really knows that she was a British home child. Okay, wasn't sure. Um, and then you are, I know that you are passionate about getting the word out and, and sharing. So Belinda says that this is the first time that she's hearing about this. And it's so cool. Not, yeah. so, and that doesn't surprise right. me in the least, but I'm right. glad she, you know, at least she knows now. And it is important to get the word out. It's very, very important. You know, same as my grandmother. It's important that people that I know, and I talk about it all the time. And I'm sure 
I'm sure my friends around here are just like, oh my God, not again. But um, <laughs> it's just, it's, I'm passionate about it. I am even before I knew about my grandmother. I'm just a passionate genealogist and I just love working with the British Home Children Records. I do. It's, it's very fulfilling for me. I'm and did you find a lot of situations? Sorry. Sorry. Did you find a lot of situations? I know I found at least one where there was quite a number of siblings. They were all separated, all went to different places, but in time, they all got connected again. In fact, one of them, one of the families brought their mother over because yeah. she was finally, you know, able to reconnect with the children that she lost. It was quite emotional. Yeah, they did. There is quite a few of those. Um, that, uh, you know, brought their families over eventually um, to stay with them here in Canada. Some Most times they never saw their families again. I do have a, uh, a Blundell family in um, Heron County. They never saw each other for 50 years. Hmm. They weren't reunited. And this happens a lot. There's quite a few newspaper articles that we have on our, on our Facebook group and that, that they actually reunited after 50 or 60 years. In fact, there's a picture of my mother and her two sisters. They didn't see each other for almost 30 years. And it's in the Blythe Standard. But after the separation that I talked about with my grandmother, um, there is a, I got the original picture and it's the three of them sitting on a park bench and they hadn't seen each other in over 30 years. Well, I see that our time is starting to run out. Yep, so there, is more, there is one more question, Linda, though. Okay, oh, okay. one more. Your time. I think, see there's a couple more minutes. Um, yep. So Doreen asks, have you found a connection with these children um, and the U.S. orphan trains? No, this has nothing to do with the orphan trains at all. No, that's a totally different thing. And there are books out about that, but this is totally uh, on another level. It's not the same thing at all. Okay, great. Any more questions tonight? I thank everybody for coming out. It's been a real pleasure. And I hope, you know, you enjoyed the presentation. Well, we want to thank you, Cookie, for presenting uh, all this information about the British Home Children and uh, hopefully the fact that we're going to have this recorded and put on our YouTube channel will, will mean that there will be many, many, many more people that will be introduced to this uh, very tragic historical happening. It is. And, and there was no, there's been no apology from the Canadian government. Uh, Australia and Britain did apologize, but Canada refuses to apologize for their part in it. Hmm. So I just want to get it out there and I'd be happy to do another presentation if anybody is requiring one for another group or something. I'd be more than happy to do that. Okay. So um, I think uh, Cindy will... We'll let you know, let us all know when the uh, recording will be done on the YouTube channel. She usually puts a message in the Facebook group. Okay. Um, and with that, I'm going to end the session now and hope to see you all on May the 19th at our next webinar. It's going to be really, really interesting with our uh, cemetery team. They're all excited about doing it. Is, so, Is that going to be on the uh, OGS thing on Facebook? Oh, yeah, it'll be on. Yep. Yep. Okay. Yes, it will. Right. So anyway, good night and right. thank you, good everybody, night. again. Thank you, Cookie. Thank yes, you very thank much. You. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye.